As we saw some while ago, the four approaches to that have developed within the Muslim world towards modernity are premised on the different role accorded to religious law in the public sphere. And it is quite impossible to give you in the short span time that we have available here even a rough overview of Islamic law as Roy Mutahede in, in his great novel, The Mantle of the Prophet, showed it, the, 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 the training required to become a scholar of Islamic law is exceedingly long. Generally, uh, around 20 years is normally considered to be normal before you then leave the uh, educational institution and then practice it. I do not claim that sort of expertise and I certainly cannot claim to bring across anything resembling a complete overview within the short time we have available. So all that we can do in this format is to point out a few common misperceptions about the nature of Islamic law as it pertains to the constitutional order of a state. So let's start with one of the common misperceptions that you will often encounter in political discourse in the Muslim world, as well as in political discourse outside as it refers to the Muslim world. And that is a common misperception that there is such thing as the Islamic law. You hear often the word Sharia as if it was a homogenous, clearly identifiable body. That is not the case. One of the things that you need to remember is that from the recognized sources in the early centuries of the development of the Islamic Empire that we had covered earlier on, you have within the Sunni world four equally orthodox, equally valid schools of Islamic law are developing. You have the, the, the Hanbali, the um, Hanafi, the Maliki and the Shafi'i schools. They then come to dominate certain regions and for right now, we don't need to concern which regions belong to one of these groups. But what you should remember now is that there are these four distinct schools of Islamic law. And they do have developed quite distinct rules. And rules that are often at variance with each other concerning fairly important um, functional areas of the law. That is the first thing that you need to bear. So there's a great degree of diversity within Islamic law. Then these were the Sunni schools. Then you have at least two schools of, of Islamic law within the Shia sect. So that's at least six schools. And then there are numerous subsects. So that just keep this in mind for the moment that there is a broad variety of equally orthodox views about what Islamic law makes, uh, what it constitutes. That's the first common misperception. The other misperception is, and that goes back to the, again, to the early period of the Islamic world, as you, you hear it at the beginning, there was a unification of religious rulership and secular sort of, um, political leadership. And this unification is also reflected in the, um, in the religious law, which has led some commentators to describe it as a deontology, uh, a normative system. And they have therefore denied it the, the characteristic of a proper legal system because they say it mixes internal duties, duties that only the, the, the believer himself or herself can control. So whether, for example, you are a good person, whether you're living up to the religious stipulations of belief, for example, things that an, another human being cannot know and therefore cannot control. So they distinct, you know, the, there's no distinction, these people claim, between internal duties and 
external duties, duties that are owed to other human beings and therefore can, can be controlled by other human beings and are subject to be um, observed by others. And I say that Islamic law does not make this distinction because if you open a, a handbook on Islamic law, it will, you will have rules about contracts, rules about marriage, rules about inheritance, but at the same time rules about um, you know, prayer, rules about fasting, rules about the pilgrimage, things that really only concern the individual. And this is... It's, it's, it's a correct observation, but this does not mean that we cannot distill the distinct legal elements within Islamic law. So, I would like you to remember that the common misperception that there is no such thing as a legal system within Islam is probably problematic. So, yes, let's assume for the moment that there is a legal system that is susceptible to be analyzed with the legal methodological tools that we use also to analyze any other legal system. Now, the problem is that the modern legal systems that we have in, that have developed in the West, they obviously developed in a Christian context, and that holds particularly true for international law. And there's now the, the tendency to describe these modern legal system as being derived from Christianity. And you hear this claim again from both sides of the aisle. I would like you to consider the, the option or the possibility that the divide lies not so much between a Christian-inspired law as it developed in the modern age in Western Europe, but more that the divide lies between rational, formally organized law and religious law on the others. And that is a distinction that Max Weber developed and proposed for the first time, and I think it's a very useful distinction. So the distinction is religious law, and he says then there are common characteristics between Islamic law, Jewish law, Hindu law, medieval canon law, basically all legal systems that are based on revelation, and are administered by priests as the interpreters of this revelation. So he groups them as one group, religious law, as he calls it, sacred law, and he opposes this with modern, formally organized, rational law as it developed in the modern bureaucratic state. And I think that this distinction is more useful, analytically more helpful, And he suggests that any sacred law, whether it's Islamic, Jewish, Hindu, Christian, will share certain characteristics that sets it apart from formally organized law. And its reliance on revelation makes it, as what he calls formally, procedurally, irrational, because it's outside the scope of rational critique, because it's based on revelation. And therefore, there is no easily identifiable source for, for example, for new law. There is a tendency towards um, tradition and towards maintaining the status quo. And then he also says that any sacred law will have a tendency to what he calls material irrationality. So it's focused on ethical political ethical um, norms, political expediency, the outcome of a particular case. And he describes it as becoming particularly clear in the way cases are administered. And that is, particularly in the Islamic, you know, in the traditional Islamic uh, sense, quite apparent what he calls Qadi Justiz. So that each case is looked at on its own merits for, you know, trying to achieve justice in this particular case. And he contrasts this sacred law with formally rational law, as it develops in a bureaucratic system, that aims to apply abstract general principles to individual cases. And you see the implications this has for the, the government and for the way society is structured. 
Now let's, in the few minutes that I have, let's move to the constitutional order. First of all, when we speak about constitutional law, any law that governs the, um, the relationship between the different organs of a state can be termed constitutional law. So we will be able to identify a constitutional law of the Abbasid Caliphate. But in the modern iteration of constitutional law, we normally refer to a covenant, whether it's written or unwritten, as for example in the British case, that sets apart and delineates the respective mandates and respective powers of the organs of a state. And it does so in an abstract, predictable manner. And it's administered in courts that follow abstract, predictable procedures. And it is here where, according to Weber, and I think he's correct there, that sacred laws, societies that adhere to sacred laws, will find the biggest obstacle to enter and embrace the modernization process fully because they will not be able to rationalize or to, to structure according to rational principle, that's more correctly, the way the different organs of the state are arranged. So this is his suggestion and I'd like you to, to, to ponder this for a while, whether you would agree that the existence of a sacred law rather than the particular character of the particular religion is what makes it hard for the states that we will look at in this course to fully embrace the, the challenge of the modern period. And I think to some extent it explains the relative failure, for example, of the Tanzimat period in the Ottoman area, because they were not able to really follow what, for example, the Japanese did, to embark on this process of defensive modernization in order to, a, to be able to stand up to the challenge of other states in a competitive system, because they were held back by a legal system that is both formally and materially irrational. 